del progetto nel senso di uno stile di pensare che è di Bisucci funziona ad esempio Buongiorno a tutti, siamo un attimo in ritardo per un problema di connessione, ma cominceremo proprio in, in due minuti. Se per favore spegnete tutti il vostro microfono e lo riaprite solo per fare domande alla fine. Grazie. Io spazio Have you noticed nobody ever sits in the first room wherever you are in the world? As I said, I live in this. Ah! <laughs> Now, after that, I force people, right? <laughs> My trick when I was teaching is I would go in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can be more younger for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid I cannot switch down this device without going through. Yeah. Uh, but if I, I click this, I keep this, like this, yes, and I keep this reducing the size and yeah. I'm keeping this. Uh, yeah, like it's fine. You can move that up the box. Um, no, it stays here. So I don't think that this is the best. My talks are talking about technology. So. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go with this uh, visualization and then I will switch the, the, the only way is this one, which which the slides okay, okay. and I will, yes, I will keep up. I'm pretty sure you can go full screen yeah. and hide everything on Zoom. So the age not able to. Go full screen like this, and I will switch the, uh, the slides for you. No, I'll do it because there's a lot of animation. Yeah. So if okay. that will work or not? It should work. Okay. Let me see if it works. All right. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That's working. It's just a bit. So just a bit. Okay. okay. Sorry for the delay. So thank you all for attending the, the, the lecture. And our guest of today is uh, Professor Stanley Chor. He's from the Queen Mary University College, but just since January. Yeah, since two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> since a couple of weeks. So he spent uh, his past uh, 15 or even more years at the yeah. Imperial uh, College, but he was a uh, resident in Neuchâtel, got his uh, degree in Neuchâtel, and then his PhD from the uh, University of Potsdam. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so now in uh, university, uh, Primary University College, uh, is not teaching any geology, but is in charge for geological data and uh, environment in this uh, institute that is called the Dairy Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Digital Environment Research Institute. Yeah, that's it. And he's uh, in charge, the head of section on environmental and geological data. So what are the topics of research of Sebi? It's difficult to say, you know, because we was with, we live in the field. Uh, yes. Uh, so he's a field geologist. From my point of view, he's a field geologist. Uh, so he's able to look at rocks. He looks at rocks. He works with rocks. He has done many projects uh, in connection with industry, with oil industry also. He's a carbon sedimentologist, for instance. He would qualify as a carbon sedimentologist. He's also a geochemist. He has worked with geochemical data, planted isotope, for instance. And uh, but he is a person that can deal with data in a very modern way, which when each time each, whatever kind of data you wish, uh, because this is what deep learning is about. And the topic of this talk will be deep learning applied to geological data, in particular to the description of course. Uh, so he will show us how you can deal with data that are very rich in uh, like the data of uh, scientific drilling or the ocean. Uh, with deep learning and artificial intelligence, whatever it is. Okay, <laughs> so please. So. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Mariano, for this uh, very nice introduction. I mean, one way to look at me changing fields is to say I'm interested in a lot of things. The other way is to say I get bored very quickly with the things I do. No, I'm actually interested in a lot of things. So what I'll talk about today is indeed deep learning, which is something I started to do with my group since 2017 and has grown and has now become essentially what I do most in, uh, in my research. And specifically, we we'll look at um, IVDP uh, core, so core material. So I just, quick show of hands here, who's a geologist? No one's a geologist. Ah, no, okay, there's a few. Okay, four geologists, five geologists. Okay, so let's have a half of them are geologists. Who is really quite comfortable with deep learning? Yeah, okay, a few. Okay. All right, great. Paleontologists. Uh, Paleontologists, that's okay. There you no, you can, you can, you can, that's good. That gives me a sense of a little bit of like the level. So this is going to be, don't worry if you're not an expert in deep learning. This is not a super technical talk, but you know, feel free to ask questions. Um, and if you are an expert in deep learning, my apologies. I'll show some architecture, but I'm not going to go into uh, the detail. My goal rather, and now let's see up. The, my agenda for the talk is the following. So the first thing is I want to demystify AI because a lot of people, right now is the bandwagon, right? And right now everybody, everybody wants to do AI and everybody thinks it's super intelligent. It's not, it's statistics. It's incredibly useful. And so that's the second thing. My second agenda is I want to show you if you're a geologist, kind of like make you enthusiastic about this because I do think it's really an interesting technology, especially if you're young, and there's a lot of things that we can do. So, you know, maybe walk away with you being enthusiastic. And who knows, maybe walk away with a few new collaborators. That'd be nice. Right. So let's see. I think, uh, I think it's removing the... Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when I started uh, with deep learning and geosciences, I've, I've always liked coding, right? When I was 15, I was coding. 2014, I saw the rise of computer vision not for geology, rise of computer vision. I thought, aha, that could be useful for uh, geosciences. Three years later, I do my first project. Everybody, all of my colleagues around me were telling me why deep learning will not work, work for geology. The data that we have is special. You know, it's not like industry data. It's not going to work. You know what? This is what? OK, that's going to be a bit of an issue. Not going? No. Not go, but, I'm going this. Yeah, but we're, you're going to have to click a lot. Ah, um, okay. This, because I animated all the slides. So maybe I can just can have the laptop. Maybe it's easier and I click. No? No, because uh, they have oh, to see it. Okay, all right. That's, okay, that's so, priority. so this is what data had to tell me, right? Geological data, I'm just data. Now, this data has characteristics, of course, right? So let's, let's uh, make uh, Mariano work, right? Mm. So geological data is click. Click. <laughs> It's small data sets, right? So often we deal with small data sets. So we need to have uh, algorithms that are able to handle small data set. But we also sometimes have big data, right? So we have the full range. 
Now, next one, and, and that's important. A lot of um, geological data is geospatial and temporal. So it has, so where it comes from is important. And sometimes we're looking at time series, okay? So that's a characteristic of geological data. Next one, it's often sparse. Think of a volume of seismic, right? That you have wells in it. You only sample one thousandth of the volume. So you have sparse data, but it's high dimensional, meaning you can have a lot of different characteristics you measure on this data set. So that's one of the things that we often encounter. Next one, it can have large footprints. And I'm looking at you, geophysicists. Think of your seismic data, gigabyte of data for one volume, okay? Last one, it often lacks label. The hardest thing to do is to label the data. You know this, when you look at your thing section and you start to do all the work to basically identify each grain, it takes a long time. So we don't have a lot of label. None of what I put here is unique to geological data, okay? So essentially, geological data is data, and there's no reason why deep learning could not be applied. All right, let's go to the next one. So I'm going to focus on four. So for my friends who are biologists or anthropologists, uh, a core is a piece of rock that you extract from the subsurface. Um, you have wells that you can drill to, you know, several kilometers. And in those wells, you recover the rocks, okay, the, the core, the core material. So why cores? So next one. Uh, because cores are essential for geological interpretation when you look at the subsurface, okay? You can go to outcrops, but if you look at marine or even continental region where you don't have outcrops, cores is the only thing you can use. And you have to describe the rock. It's at the basis of a lot of things. The facies model, the sequence geographic model, all of it is based, you know, in part with descriptive data. I went too fast, yeah? <laughs> at the end of the talk, you'll be well trained. Okay. Uh, it's also very expensive, okay? Getting a core is very, very expensive. <laughs> I used to work for an organization called the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. Back then, 15, 18 years ago, going at sea for two months to get the course costed about $7 million, okay? So expensive material. Next one. Uh, the good thing about course is they're often digitalized, okay? So, so it's a nice thing to work on because you have a digital version of it, and it's available for both academia and industry, okay? So, that, so you can do something here that's useful for academic research, but also useful for industrial research, and I think I have one more. Yes. And I just want to acknowledge what I'll show you today are basically is all based on cores coming from the IUDP, the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, which is a very rich archive of core thin section material that I encourage you to use if you don't already do this. All the data is available for free. Right. So this is a, an infamous study that was published in 2015, and it's very close to the three of us here because this is carbonate sedimentology. So I'm going to focus on carbonate rocks. So rocks made of the, the mineral carbonate. And this study was published by Stephen Lockyer and Junevi in 2015. And what they did, just to explain, is they generated thin section. So this is like a, a small slab of rock that you look through. In this thin section, they put some fossils. But these are artificial thin sections. Okay, So they're completely controlled. They took a picture of them. So they know very well the name of this rock. The, the carbonate rocks are named after their textures, and then you describe what's inside. So they know the texture very well because they controlled it. And they send those to about 60 labs around the world, all experts, of course. No, I, I was one of the labs that received those things, so I, we're somewhere there, okay? And they basically said, they, there was really two questionnaires. First, what's the name of that rock, okay? Second, do you find this rock easy or difficult to describe and to assign a name, right? Okay, so here's one rock, okay, but there's lots of, there's, I don't remember how many thin sections we had to describe, but there's several of them. Um, so that, look at that one rock, and these are the names that the 60 individuals came up with, okay? <laughs> it's like, practically, I think the maximum number, Waxton, which is the correct uh, name, only eight people got it right. Then you have some evidence, that some people say it's a Waxton Paxton, okay, that's rightish, but not fully right. Sometimes you have Waxton with something inside, okay, that's correct. But you also have completely wrong answer there. Okay. Sorry. Brainstone. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. Right. So really, really 
a, a range of answer for that one thing. But what's more scary, look at the little box here at the top. Let's see if I can use- In the middle. middle. In the middle of the arrow. Ah, yeah, there we go. Look, what, how, how difficult is this rock to describe? Very easy. <laughs> so not only we're wrong, we're very confident when we're wrong, okay? So that was really, for me, something that triggered my interest in using automated ways to describe rocks. Because I, I thought, okay, if, if we're so bad at it, and you describe a rock, you describe a rock, I describe a rock, we all have different description of the same rocks. We cannot compare our results. If we do automatic identification, even if there is a bias, so we're not always wrong, at least it's the same algorithm that will describe all the rocks for your study and, and around the world. So that's where I see kind of like the, 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 uh, the motivation for my work. Let's go to the next one. Now you could say, no, these bad results is because our classification is bad, but it's not. This is the Dunham classification that everybody, or well, most uh, carbon and sedimentologists use today. And the Dunham classification has arbitrary uh, cutoffs. So they're arbitrary, right? But they're very clear. So one of these arbitrary cutoffs is the size of the grain, whether they're less or more than two millimeters. And then it's the quantity. Do you have more or less than 10% of those grains? Other cutoffs is whether the grain touch, whether there is mud, whether there is no mud, etc. But those criteria are very clear. It's just that we're not very good humans at systematically applying them, and we're even worse at doing this 12 hours a day. Okay, so when I was on the ship and you had to describe a lot of course, it became very repetitive, and you just looked at the rock and you gave it a name. So that's part of the problem. Let's go to the next one. Right. So we're gonna use neural networks from now on, okay? And I'm gonna demonstrate that with basically with some of the research that my uh, group has done, that we can use neural network to do descriptive geology. So what's a neural network? Go ahead. So I'd like you to think of neural network as functions because that's what they are, okay? So that's a demystification part. It's not intelligent, it's just a function that can learn with some inputs and some learnable parameter and can come up with a prediction, this Y hat, okay? So that's a little bit uh, um, esoteric, but mathematically, this is how you could represent a neural network. But we prefer to represent it this way, right? The geologist feels immediately more comfortable with this, it's a diagram. Okay, perfect, okay. So that is the way we represent neural networks. So this little bubble here, those are artificial neurons. And you can see that we organize them by layers, okay? The black arrows represent connection. So data that flows from one side to the other side of the layer. This particular architecture is a very simple architecture. It's called a fully connected neural network uh, or a multilinear perceptron, right? Same, two names, same thing. So let's look at the different layers. So first, uh, if you, Mariano, we have two special layers. The first one is the input layer. The input layer essentially has as many neurons as you have inputs. So we're gonna be dealing with images. So the number of neurons we'll have in the input layer, in the case of the images that we look at, are gonna be the number of pixel times the number of pixel of the image. So the, the, the pixel resolution times three, if you look at a color image because we have RGB. Okay, so that controls the input. Now, all the way at the end, we have the output. That is completely controlled by your task. If we do a classification, which is a lot of things, a lot of time what we'll do today, we'll have as many neurons as we have classes, and the value of that neuron, we'll use a special function for this, but the value of that neuron will represent the probability of your sample belonging to that particular class. So this class, that class, etc. And now in the middle, we have the so-called hidden layers because they're hidden by the input and the output. This is where the magic happens, okay? Because here we can change those parameters to change the flow of the function and change the prediction to essentially get the correct prediction through um, iterative training of our neural network. Right, now if you have a lot of these uh, hidden layers, so more than uh, one or two, it's a deep neural network because you have lots of layers, okay? So that's what deep learning is, right? So it's not, that complicated. But let's look at the uh, unit now. If you click, right. Let's look at what this uh, artificial neuron is, right? 
An artificial neuron is actually fairly easy to understand. It's a fairly easy function. So first of all, we have inputs. So if you're in the input layers, this would be whatever your pixel are. But if you're in the middle layer, that would be the values coming from the previous layer. Okay. So we have inputs, the Xs. If you click, we then have weights. These weights are numbers between zero and one that we can change to the training process. So those are trainable parameters. Okay. And then we have a function, so let's go, right, that's called the transfer function. A transfer function is a very simple linear function, okay? So if you look at the top, all that the transfer function does is you take your weights, you multiply them by your values, so this is a matrix form, right? Uh, and then you add a bias or an intercept if you want, okay? The bias is also trainable, okay? So that's a linear function. Now, neural network have millions of neurons often, okay, or at least hundreds of thousands of neurons. The problem is if you if you add hundreds of thousands of millions of linear functions, you get one linear function. Really boring. You can't solve a lot of things with this. So really the magic or the, the trick is the next thing, which is the activation function, right? So after you basically apply the transfer function, you need in the neuron to go through the activation function. The activation function essentially has a threshold below which the neuron will not fire, so you'll return zero, typically, and above which you will return a value. And what value you return depends on the function you choose. It could be just the value itself, you know, that's a, the most famous, most used transfer function today is ReLU, it does exactly that. Or maybe you'll change, maybe you return a transform version of that uh, value. But the point is, Thanks to the activation function, we now get a nonlinear response behavior. Okay, so now that you start to add millions or at least hundreds of thousands of nonlinear functions together, you can start to approximate any mathematical function, right? Arbitrary comp complexity, and this is why neural network work. Let's go to the next one. So, first case study, and this is how it all started for me. Uh, was classifying carbonate texture using deep learning. So now you're going to have to click a lot. Okay, so really the, the fundamental question that we've asked with the first project is, can we use deep learning to predict carbonate texture? I'm going to, spoiler alert here, yes, we can, okay? <laughs> now let's go to the next one. So we also were interested uh, of seeing if we can go beyond uh, texture. Can we identify individual grains of carbonate? So we've done a little bit of work on this, so I'll show you that. And next one. And always fundamentally, the goal of our research was to see what the best architecture and the best treatment of the data was to achieve the most uh, reasonable result. Okay. Now, this is a particular type of neural network known as a CNN or convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network have lots of uh, filters, uh, convolutional filters. Hey, geophysicists, you know your convolution filters, right? They're used. Uh, it's a mathematical function that extracts features from images, essentially. Uh, and it's a very efficient uh, architecture for images because you need less trainable parameters. And you can also look at an image uh, as a 2D feature and or a 3D feature even if you want, not as a just long line of pixels, which you would have to do with the, the first architecture I've shown you. So if you click, so the first part of our neural network, uh, the CNN is known as the feature extraction bit, okay? That's where we have all these, these uh, filter um, taking the, the features. Then we have a flattened layer, right? So that means that all these uh, these values that we're getting, these little maps of features that we're getting, we flatten them into a linear uh, layer for our, for our neural network, just like the one I showed you. And now, well, okay, we clicked. And then in the end, we end up with a classification head, okay? That bit here is, is what's used to do the classification. That's a neural network, a fully connected neural network, the way I showed you at the beginning. So why am I showing you this? Let's go to the next one. It's because one thing that we pioneered in my group is transfer learning for geological images. One big issue we have in geology is we don't have enough labeled data, like I said. Okay, so to give you an idea, the network I showed you, all these classical network, VGG16, if you know your, your neural network, they're trained on a data set known as ImageNet. ImageNet has 56 million images. 
I don't have 56 million images, right? We have about 100,000 images, and that's considered a lot. And if you look at the geological literature, most people have a few thousand images. So very low, a very small data set. So the problem is we have too many trainable parameters for very small data set. But what we can do is we can, if you click, we can use the feature extraction bit that is already pre-trained on ImageNet. So literally pre-trained on these images and 56 uh, uh, minus 6 uh, million images uh, uh, in this category, okay? They are images, they're not images of rocks. But the reasoning is that features in images, low level features in images, don't depend on the topic that you're studying. So whether you're looking at rocks or ice cream or puppies, right? I know some of you prefer puppies to rock, but you know, stay with me here. Um, the features of the images are the same. So if we could reuse that bit from that was trained from ImageNet, so reuse the weight, we'd gain a lot of time, but also we would not need that many images because all we need to do, so if you click now, is to basically train the classification head on the 100,000 images we have. And this is a technique that was really cutting edge in 2016, 2017. Now it's become quite routine, um, but it's uh, known as transfer learning, and that's what we'll be using in the next slide. Right, so this is a paper we published last year. So the idea of our study was to explore the impact of the data set size and the network architecture on uh, classification of carbonate blocks. So if you don't get too relaxed, Mariano, you have a job, right? So basically here we've used, um, we have 104,000 images. We sample this as a medium sized data set of 41,000 images. And then we decided to go where most geological data sets are, which is 7,000 images, okay? So we have three different data sets and we wanted to check the impact of those data sets. Now click again. And we also have about a dozen uh, architecture. These are all you know, uh, neural network that exist on which we could do transfer uh, learning. And then essentially uh, what this uh, shows is we've evaluated each one of these uh, network with different data sets, Inception V3 at the time was the one that worked the best for our data set. So in the context of our data set, except for the small data set where VGG19 uh, outperforms the other. So if you want to click on the next one, okay. The other thing that it's important to mention here is that we have a test set. So there's, there are images that we didn't, did not use in the training process at all. We kept them aside. And the result I will show you is always on the test set. So completely separate, not part of the training set. And then 80% of the image are used uh, as our training set. And we actually did what is known as uh, K-full cross-validation for those of you who do uh, deep learning. So, so for all of our hyperparameter tuning, so essentially to train the network, we use cross-validation. Right, so let's look at some results. So this is, this is one of my favorite term in machine learning. This is known as a confusion matrix, okay? But it's not the confusion, it's not your confusion, or it shouldn't be your confusion, it's the network's confusion, okay? On the vertical side here, we have the true label. So that's what the rock actually is. That's what the human classified the rock to be. So you recognize here, bound stone, float stone, grain stone, et cetera. On the horizontal axis, we have the predicted label. Okay, that's what the network thinks the rock is. This is the test set, okay? On, uh, on the diagonal here, you have correct classification, okay? And the color represents the percentage. So you can see, you want actually your, your classification to fall under the, the diagonal. This is the largest data set, the best model. The results are pretty good. We essentially have anywhere between 87% accuracy for the floatstone to 94% accuracy for the mudstone, okay? And anywhere in between here, we have these, uh, these results. So that's actually better than the humans in the Lockyer um, study. Um, but if you click, I think I have a little arrow, yeah, there we go. But we do have some classes that seem to perform a little less well. And we'll see in a minute why uh, this is the case. But anyway, that's kind of like the main uh, result of the study. So let's move on. And the reason why we have an issue with the uh, with uh, some of the, those classes is apparent here. So this is the uh, the different proportion of uh, species in our small data set because we downsampled this one. It's very well uh, balanced, meaning each one of these classes have the same number of images. 
the 42k data set already starts to be imbalanced. You see some, uh, some of our classes are not as well represented. And the larger data sets represents the geological distribution of our facies, meaning we have much less bound stone and float stone, the classes that perform slightly less well, then we have mudstone, for instance, right? Or packstone or waxstone, the, the dominant lithologies. So I think if you click, uh, yeah. So, so basically, click again, there you go. Uh, some classes are simply more abundant than others. And that's a problem we have in geosciences. I'm sure it's a problem that all sciences have. Um, the ideal world of you know, the perfectly balanced data set is unfortunately not realistic, but there are things we can do about it. Okay, so let's let's move on. Uh, and before we balance our classes, I want to take us to uh, another topic, which you're going to love this yeah. one. It's looking yeah. at identifying components in our in our uh, fin section, not just looking at the texture, but individual components. So. Uh, we, we're going to use uh, data from IODP 359 and IODP 133194. I did my PhD on 194, uh, and that's what we, I we forgot to mention. The previous study is based on 194. Right, so let's go ahead. These are the components that Harriet, my student, identified in those rocks. So we see we have about a dozen, dozen components. We didn't go to species level or anything fancy. We just went with you know, large groups, essentially. Mostly super imbalanced, okay? Mostly we have forums, 43%. So you can predict that we'll do very well on forums, but we'll see. Uh, we have gastropod, red algae, serpulids. Ah, I have some serpulids, 1% serpulids. Sorry, it's not much. Um, aggregate grains, some corals, etc. So let's move on to the next one. So here, what the goal here, so before what we did was classification. The goal here is to do segmentation. So even one image, find all the instances of these classes into that image, okay? So it's a different machine learning task. For this, there are a few famous um, um, architecture that you can use. One of them is YOLO, which is now, I think, in version eight or something, but we use YOLO V5, okay? YOLO is actually a one-stage, single-stage detector. So what this means is it looks at an image, it uses dark net to basically decide where the features of interest are, and in one go, it also identifies what those features are. So it's a one-step uh, approach. It's very popular nowadays, uh, and it's fast. Now let's go to the next, if you can click. The other technology we explored is uh, known as an RCNN, okay? Uh, and uh, actually, uh, this one is known as the, the faster RCNN, okay? And this one is slightly different, because what we do, I think, if you click, yeah. So first, basically, we have a feature extractor, okay, that looks at all the pictures. But then we go to a region proposal generator. So we have a special network that will look at the image and say, hey, dude, I think there's something interesting there, okay? And we'll put little boxes for the next network. So if you click for the box classifier to then go and say, yep, this is that, yep, this is that, oh, no idea what this is, yep, this is actually, the network never say no idea what it is, it say, yep, this is that, so yep. why not be wrong? Um, but as you can see here, this is a, this, this older architecture is slower because it has two steps. So we'll assess both of these technology in the next slide. Right, so this is the result. So uh, on a vertical axis, you have average precision, okay? On the horizontal axis, you have the different classes. So you see aggregate, bivalve, rhizome, etc. So that's a class. Here at the top, you can see the mean average precision and also the average inference time. So how long it took for the network to guess what was in uh, the test set. Okay, again, this is all the test set. So first observation, YOLO uh, V5 has about 59% uh, average mean average precision. Faster R CNN, 73%. I'm going to take the hint of waiting a little longer for 23% increase or, or no, 14% increase in precision. Because indeed, you know, the average inference time is, uh, is 48 milliseconds with the OLOV5 versus 629 milliseconds with, uh, with the faster R CNN. So if your application requires very, very fast decision, because you have to decide right now to take, I don't know, like a pill out of a, uh, out of a production belt because it, it's bad and you don't want it to continue, right? Then maybe this plays a role. But if you're a geologist and you used to make your, your 
uh, classification in, a, I don't know, an hour. Uh, this is still ever extremely fast, right? Okay, so now let's look at, uh, if you want to click on the first one. So you can see here uh, the red uh, diamond represents faster RCNN and the blue dot represents Yolo V5. In every classes, Yolo V5 is outperformed by fa our faster RCNN, okay? So that's the first uh, conclusion. Then we also see that we have some classes like bivalve, um, gastropod, and um, I think this is the red algae, yeah that actually are pretty good. They, they, we, we get decent results on those classes. So if you don't mind going to the next one. And this is how it looks, right? This is a piece of rock. And when we apply our model, what it does is it gives us a box and then it tells us what it thinks it's in the box. So here it tells us, hey, I think it's a coral. It also tells us I have 83% confidence it's a coral. So you have a way, uh, you can have a human in the loop you have a way to say, well, hang on, 68%, let me double check, right? Gastropod here, this one, I'm pretty confident it did a pretty good job. Forum here, um, coral here, I'm not so sure, but even this red algae did a pretty good job on that, okay? So this, these uh, features that it does well on have one characteristic, they're fairly large. So it, it, it finds enough structure there to do well. So if you don't mind going to the next one, and again, there's also some uh, instances where it performs very, very poorly. So you see here for the aggregate, uh, faster RCNN is at 50%. For forum, it's maybe at 55%. Uh, YOLO V5, just 10. It's at 30%, so very bad performance on both aggregate and forums. So let's go to the next one to understand what's going on. Even though we have 43% forums, forums are very small and they're very hard to distinguish here. So this is a core that is full of water. So it's basically non litified sand. Maybe it's even coming from the side of the well and is not in place. And the glitter of the water on the digital image is really throwing the network completely off. You can see it finds lots of forums. I don't think they're forums. They're basically sandy grains, right? So, but it identifies all of this as forums. So of course it gets like very, very um, low performance there. And even like very confident, right? 92% confidence it's a, it's a forum, right? And interestingly, see this, this is a glare on the side of the core because of water that becomes a skeletal fragment, okay? Uh, at 77% uh, accurate confidence, okay? So not everything works, right? So you still have to be very cautious when you apply this technology. There are things you have to look at, but the proof is in the pudding. So let's go to the next one. So this is a bit of a complex slide, so I'll take a bit of time. This is uh, two wells that were not used in our training set. They're both on the Maran Plateau, so level 194, but from a different platform, the Southern Maran Plateau. So site 1199 and site 1198. Gilles Conesa, um, and he, he's a French uh, paleontologist. He spent like a long time, I don't know how long, but probably months, describing this four to you know, a good level of detail. So back when he was uh, back at, uh, on shore, and he did a superb job because it's, he's an expert, you know, and he's an expert in coral, so trying to find uh, all these different um, elements. And what we did is we also applied our train algorithm that I showed you before, to the same core, but at a much higher resolution, okay? So if you don't mind clicking, okay. So when you see black, it means that the human estimate for that particular uh, group is higher than, the, uh, than the, the neural network estimate. Then keep in mind, this is basically going down in the well. So this is 350 meters below surface. This is about 400 meters. I think it's hard to read here, 400 meters below surface. So essentially you see trends that represent temporal trends, okay? Um, okay, now why do we have um, Halimeda here or green algae? Why is it overestimated by the human? Well, it's not part of our training set. So we've not actually predicted any Halimeda, so that makes sense, okay? Let's go now to the next one. When you see yellow, it's when the machine learning overestimated the, uh, the, um, the component. You can see the forms, of course, we overestimate the component. Now, you could argue maybe the human underestimated. In this case, I don't think it's true. I think our machine learning model doesn't do a good job with forms. In blue is where you have the overlap, where essentially both estimates are the same. And the point I want to make is that, sure, the machine learning method, you know, we, 
We don't have a large training data set. We do did only a few sites. You know, this is not, I would not be confident to sell this to an oil company or to anyone to deploy. But the machine learning method reflects the trend very well. If you just want to have a quick a quantitative, semi-quantitative estimate of the trends in those rains, mostly you capture them. Look at the blue. It's, it mostly captured those trends, certainly for the red algae and for the main component. Now, if you don't mind clicking, the, the one more. The difference, though, is that what took months for a human took exactly 207 minutes, a little bit more than three hours. And we did it at a much higher resolution because we used 12,000 images, OK? And essentially, it's a two centimeter resolution because that's the size of the image that, that we use. So you can process a thousand, tens of thousands of images very quickly, right? And then we didn't even do this, but you can go and clean your results where you can put a threshold and say, hey, if you're below 90% confident, just don't count it. So that's the sort of thing that you can do. And you can count the number of instances of, say, um, mollusks that you find per image and, and produce this work. Right, let's go to the next one. So um, who has heard of ChatGPT? Yeah, okay, yeah, everybody, good, okay, let's go. So we're gonna look at generative AI, okay? And I'll show you that generative AI can have some use or has some use in image generation as well. I'm sure you're aware of this, not just chat GPT, and I'll show you some creative way of using it in geosciences. Let's go, although I say creative, but it's my work, so <laughs> slightly biased. Um, so the question here is, can we leverage um, these technology for, uh, for geosciences? Go to the next one. And I'll show you two case studies that will demonstrate that. Okay, let's go. Before we see what we can do with the tool, let's define what the tool is. So imagine that you have here a neural network, fully connected neural network, maybe with a CNN that takes an image, right? Like a, the, 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 an image of a two here, right? That we'll look at in the complex images. And let's say, if you don't mind clicking, Let's say that now you take this data and you put it through one of those fully connected neural network that tapers down. So where each layer becomes progressively smaller until, if you don't mind clicking, until you get it here into a bottleneck, right? That bottleneck here in this particular case is represented by two neurons. For most of my application, it's a thousand neurons, but that still is a big reduction in the dimension of your initial uh, image. Now, this, uh, is known as the uh, latent space, right? The latent space, um, because it's it's a if you want, it's a compressed representation of your image, right? Now that only works because this is known as an encoder. So you basically take this image, you encode it into this latent space. Of course, you can do that completely arbitrarily and and not in a useful way. But the way we train this network, click again, is we then take that latent space and we reconstruct with a mirror image network uh, that, that uh, number, okay? So at the end, we get a reconstructed image. And then we can, of course, compare pixel by pixel the two images and calculate uh, mean square error, for instance. And that's how we can train a network to do a good job at creating a latent space from which we can decode an image. So that's the principle of, of, um, of essentially the encoder-decoder uh, architecture, okay? And it's, we capture essentially a statistical distribution of your images or of your text, of your words, or whatever you want. Let's go to the next one. The magic comes if you think about sampling that latent space, that space in the middle. Imagine that we have, again, only two components in that latent space. In our cases, we'll have a thousand again, but it doesn't matter. It's easier to see things in, two, uh, in 2D. The color represents the different numbers, right, that, uh, that have been encoded. If you click on it, you can sample, say you want a eight, but an eight that's drawn slightly differently. You can go to an existing eight, add a little bit of noise, right? So a little bit of noise to move away from the exact position of that eight and use that space in a latent space that doesn't exist, it's not one of your data points, to reconstruct an eight that has never been drawn before, okay? And we'll do exactly the same with geological images. Let's go to the next one. A big architecture uh, for this type of work is the GAN architecture, the generative um, adversarial network architecture, uh, where essentially the idea is you start with random noise or data, Okay, you'll see we'll, we'll do, uh, we'll actually mostly start with data. 
And out of this, you generate an image, a fake image, but then you also have another uh, network known as a discriminator that takes a fake image, takes a real image, and determines whether your fake image is real or fake, okay? Because it's trained on real image, it can tell you if it's real or fake. And what you do is adversarial, because at the beginning, both networks are pretty clumsy at their job, but as you train them with more and more iteration, it gets, the generator gets better at creating fake images, and the discriminator gets better at finding fake images, and so it forces the generator to be even better, which forces the discriminator to be better, et cetera, et cetera. In some instances, what you want to do is use the generator. That's what we'll do. But if you're in a bank and you're looking for fraud, it's really the detector that you're more interested in. Let's go to the next one. So first application, we're going to now balance our data set. Okay, I said it's in balance. Well, we can create fake force. Okay, and that's what we'll do. So let's go to the next one. So for this, we'll use a particular architecture known as a DC GAN, a deep convolutional GAN. Okay, so it's a GAN, but it has convolutional layers. Okay, so you can see this is the generator architecture, and the discriminator is just a mirror image of this. Let's look at some results. All right, so mudstone, that's a rock that's actually uh, part of our majority class, but I'm just showing you here how we can generate mudstone. Floatstone, that's a rock that's uh, part of the minority class. These are real rock images. So we can put these rock, the, 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 the uh, latent space representation of those rocks into our latent space, add a little bit of noise. And now if you click, we can generate fake images. These rocks don't exist, okay? But they look very similar to the initial rocks. Similar, but not the same. But what's importantly, what, what's important is a geologist could not tell you they're fake images, right? They look real. And because they look real and they're very close from the real deal, we can use them for training. Does it make a difference? Let's see. This, what you're looking like at here is a learning curve. It's a tool we can use in deep learning to monitor how well our uh, algorithm is doing. On a horizontal axis, you have the epoch. That's the number of iteration of training. One epoch is when we've seen all of the images. So here, we don't go very far. We stop at 25 epochs. This is kind of work in progress, right? We've not published that yet. Uh, at the top here, here you have the accuracy, so up to 95% accuracy. At, uh, on the other side, it's kind of the same thing, but we look at the loss. The loss is essentially the error that the model, model makes uh, <laughs> on the validation set. So you can see that the loss is decreasing and the accuracy is increasing per epoch, okay? The important bit, though, is this one. So the blue line here represents the accuracy or the loss for our training set. So the images we use to train the network. The orange line represents the, uh, the, the accuracy or the loss for the validation set, the set that we basically use to monitor how well the network is doing. It's not used for the training, OK? Uh, here, the, the, these two lines represent the data set without augmentation, okay? Because we just image the, the log, the, the, the well, as we go down, and we look at the resistivity image of these wells. To go to the next one. The problem is for a geologist, if you're not trained, this is not easy to interpret. This is, okay? A core is easy to interpret. A resistivity log is, is a specialist job, okay? So what we want to do is we want to use GAN, a type of GAN, to go from this to that. So go from the domain of the FMS to generate pseudo cores, okay? That, that's the goal of my student, Saira Barudi. Let's go to the next one. And for this, we use, again, a GAN, but it's a different type of GAN. It's a supervised GAN knows, known as pix 2 pix or we use, actually, pix 2 pix HD in which instead of giving noise, we give the FMS image and we ask it to generate a core. And of course, we have intervals where we have the real core, so we can compare the job of the, the generator. So you can see again, it's a, it's a gap. Let's go to the next one. So jumping straight into the results, so click. There you go. So this is the real core, okay? So here you see a real core of muddy fabric. A uh, real core of more grainy uh, fabric, rainstone with a lot of uh, biturbation. And here we have a real core of a rutstone, so part of the platform. So click again. 
And you can see this is actually the generated fake cores for that interval. And you can see they're remarkably similar. Okay, and keep in mind this is generated from that orange images of resistivity, right? So, so basically we can create pseudo cores and give them to geologists and say, hey, don't worry about the FMS, focus on this. If you go to the next one, so of course the question is, does it have? So click here. The red bar represents how well a completely random uh, group of very experienced carbonate sedimentologists, also known as my research group, um, have done on identifying texture, rock texture, in FMS images. And you see they don't do well at all. And that's normal, they've not been trained. Okay, so they do about 20%, 40%. If you give them an FMS and you say, tell me what is it, they can do it. Now, if you click again, of course, if you give them the real core images, that's the green bar, they do fairly well, right? They are at 80% accuracy. That's also because they know that then I'll check their work. So they're particularly motivated. Okay, click again. Now, this is how well they do the blue bars if you give them the generated fake image. And by the way, they don't know which one is fake, which one is real. Okay, we just tell them, okay, this is FMS, this is, this is core images, tell us what texture you think it is. And you can see immediately the difference that matters is between the red and the blue. In every case here, they didn't even identify a single pack stone, right? And red, blue, red, blue, you can see in most cases, they do much better, and actually in all cases, they do much better at identifying texture on the fake core. And they're roughly, you know, they're, they're generally speaking pretty good. Let's go to the next one. And that's the last part of my talk, okay? So if you uh, don't mind clicking. So one problem uh, that I've been talking about a lot is that we need a lot of images. You know, ideally we need about 100,000 images, I would say. This is kind of the zone I'd like to be in. Uh, if you go to the next one, the problem is labeling those images is very painful, right? And it takes a long time, right? So, and it is, click again, it is one of our Hercules heels because um, you can have, even like when any one of us do description, we can make a mistake. That actually is a significant source of noise for our model. So that's a bit of a problem. So one thing we, we are currently trying is this approach known as self-supervised learning, which is an active area of research where essentially you give some labels, but also you give a lot of data without label and the architecture on its own tries to do better. So go to the next one. So we're going to move away from the carbonates. Sorry, my friends. We're going to go into plastic, IDP expedition 383, uh, and go to the next one. And one of the reasons for this is because my student, Hisham, is not a geologist. He's an engineer. So we could not start with things that were geologically too complex for him to identify. So what we did instead is focus on core deformation. So if you've never seen coring, this is a core that's undeformed. Now, if you don't mind clicking, these are all types of core deformation. This is completely okay. induced by the coring process. It's not a geological feature. That's a soupy, so you have water here, a parking. When you pull the core, you get those nice arch, fall in, it's just debris and brecciation induced by coring. These deformation, we need to get rid of them. Because if we're going to have an algorithm later in the process that, are, that is going to focus on interpreting real geological feature, we need to first screen for this. So that's the first step. And we're going to do this, go to the next one, using an architecture known as Sinclair. So that's from the Sinclair website. It's a pretty complicated uh, algorithm. So I'm just going to cover it very, very roughly. But the idea is that you train a core CNN, so just like we've done so far. And then you have this top architecture here that um, uses augmented version of images to train the model to recognize things that belong to the same class and things that don't belong to the same class. And the way it does this is it takes one image, say a dog, and here you have a chair. Um, it augments them, so it changes them, and it passes them through a CNN, does a representation, which is a latent space. Now you know the term latent space. And then it looks at the latent space. If the latent space is similar, um, it will attract, okay? If the latent space is different, it would re repulse. So it tries to find things that are actually similar in nature. And that means that you can also give it images that is not labeled and we'll see, are you similar to this group? Then I think you're part of that group. 
And at the next iteration, it will again revisit this. So it's not once you have the label, you can also change it. If you don't mind clicking. So the type of augmentation that simply you could do are uh, there's a lot, okay, but you could have like if this is the original image, you can crop and resize, you can crop resize split, you can change to RG, uh, from RGB to, uh, to grayscale, you can just look at the green color or distort the color, you can flip, you can rotate, you can remove part of the image, you can uh, apply a filter. The point is, this is still a dog, but it's a dog that looks different, okay? So we want to train our algorithm to recognize things that belong to the same class, but look different. And so when we give them new instances, it's like, oh yeah, I've, I've seen something similar. I think it's a dog. Let's go to the next one. So that's the result. And I have two slides on results, but the first one is on a binary classification. We started with binary classification. So is this for deformed or is this for not deformed? Or this interval is for deformed or not deformed? Vertical axis, we have the test set accuracy. Okay, so you see we're pretty high, we're in the 90s. Now, where it, be, where it gets a little complicated, that horizontal axis represent the number of unlabeled images we gave to our algorithm. Okay, from zero all the way to 140,000 unlabeled images. So by unlabeled images, I mean you just take images from the well, you chop them, you don't even have to look at them, you just give them. So it's a very low cost in terms of work and effort thing to do. Now the, the dashed line represents a completely classic transfer learning approach that we've, which I showed you at the beginning of this talk. Uh, and for this, we use 12,000 images, labeled images, and we get this, this uh, performance. So 91, 92% accuracy, okay? The blue line here represents how well Simclear performs as we add more and more unlabeled images. So that's semi-supervised learning uh, image. To be fair to the comparison, we gave the same 12,000 images to Simclear as its initial data set. Remember, it needs to have some label to begin with. You can see that when we have low number of unlabeled images, Simclear performs you know, worse or about the same as the supervised performance. As we increase the number of n label images, and we gave up at 140,000 because you know Hisham has to graduate and write the paper, uh, but we see that we have a performance increase. And in fact, at 140,000 images, we're about 1% accuracy higher than the baseline supervised performance. And do you want to go to the next one? We, if we do a multi-class, so we have seven classes of different types of deformation, that gain is even more important. Now we have 2% or 3% even increase in performance. And I will point out that these curves are not flat. So I think if we really wanted, we could retrain an algorithm with maybe 300,000 images, it might um, outperform uh, things even more. So I think this is a very uh, promising uh, technology. So let's go to the next one. So that's my conclusion. I'm aware that we're probably running out of time. So let's go to, to it point by point. So hopefully I've convinced you that automatic core analysis uh, is very useful. Uh, and it's, I think it improves the speed and the accuracy at which we can do things. I don't think it replaces stratigraphers or geologists. I think it augments us that we can do things faster, better, but we still, we're still needed to check for the quality and to interpret the data. Let's go to the next one. We can do this with grains as well, but we did a very rough thing here. So I'm hoping to do much more of that in the future. Again, maybe with some of you as collaborators, but even with this very rough approach, we get some decent results or let's say promising results. Next one. I think really for me, the semi-supervised learning approach is probably where in terms of like the architecture of, of the neural network and the fundamental work on neural network should go. This ability to deal with small data sets and to take advantage of unlabeled data, which is something that the natural language processing community has done a lot, is really something we should try to, to emulate in sciences, in, in definitely in our science, maybe also in biology and other sciences. Next one. Uh, and I think generative AI, you know, it's not just for chat GPT. We can do a lot with it. So balancing data set, but also transferring between two domains is something that I think has a lot of uh, promises. So if you don't mind going to the last one. 
So I just want to say thank you. Well, first of all, to my hosts, because they really treated me very well during uh, this week. And to uh, all of you for coming and for your attention. And I'll, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Okay. So, thanks a lot. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I'm happy that they fed you during this day. So <laughs> ah, I'm very well fed, yes. <laughs> uh, so, time for question first from the audience and then we go online. Please, don't be shy. I don't bite often. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, in this particular talk, absolutely yes. Yeah. So, does it make sense to apply the same Yeah. Make some changes, make some fake images. Yeah. Make sure that the accuracy of these uh, predictions is good. Yeah. Does it make sense to apply the same yes. to the Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. So, so first of all, so, so you talk about tabular data sets, right? Yeah. So like an Excel spreadsheet. So interestingly, tabular data set is one area where classical statistical machine learning, what I call statistical machine learning, random forest or, or other models, still today outperform deep learning. So if you have a, if you just have like a statistic, just, just a tabular data set, I would first recommend that you use probably uh, gradient boosted trees, which is you know, one of the algorithm that performs the best and it's not a deep learning approach, right? Rather than, than than this, but yes, the 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 principle of data augmentation is not new, and it has in fact been approached or done first with tabular data set, with uh, with different uh, different approaches. So Smote is a classical uh, one where essentially you use an algorithm that is like known as the uh, KNN or K nearest neighbors, and what you do is you look at where in the feature space. So feature space means. If you have five columns, you have five features, right? It's what compose your data set. So you look in the feature space where two instances of your data is, and so of your minority class, and then you take statistically in that feature space a new point that doesn't exist, but that is in the middle of all of these features. And that, that way you can create new data set. It kind of works, kind of doesn't work. I mean, I've used those techniques before, not always with success, but yes, you can do this as well with, uh, with uh, um, with just uh, tabular data. Other things I've not shown you, for instance, is we we've also played with the FMS logs to because you know generating the image is cool, but really you can you don't need to. You can also take the FMS image, pair it with subsurface data like the, the log, which is tabular data, and you can do this with neural network where you can have several branch and then you concatenate your data at some point. And then you just predict what the rock is, right? And we've done this. And actually with pairing the two set of information, we get much better results than with any other um, approaches. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah? Hey, please follow up. Yeah. So let's say in my case, as a tabular label, thousand people. Yeah. Half of them have a Okay, so you have okay, so you have two class and and what are your two groups? Are they very different? No, I can tell what it is. So I'm yeah. 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 Ah, yeah. Okay. You can do this. So basically, what you what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the data. We have two gases, yeah. right? And or measurement of the two gases. Um, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna see because that's apparently what you want to predict whether or not you should do. That is going to be your label. So you can choose now whether you want to do a classification, which would be uh, zero, no gas, uh, one, CO2 is yeah. present. Or if you want to do a regression and predict how much CO2 you have, you can also do this. Then you'll use all of your, fe all of your features, including your helium content as your features. And then you'll build, again, don't use deep learning, use a, a statistical machine learning 
uh, and then you can try to predict the amount of CO2 based on the, the features. So absolutely you can do that. Uh, I would look at uh, gradient boost. Uh, so, so a gradient boosted tree um, uh, or random forest, right? Those would be the, the two algorithm uh, you'd, you'd want to use. Yeah, they're, they're usually they're the ones that outperform all of the other ones. So if you just want a quick win, go for those for double data sets. Yeah, you're welcome. Very nice. Thanks. <laughs> hey. Any other questions from the audience here in the room? Pasquale. That's because I'm old. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, especially for the students and uh, the because it's the costs. Yeah, because it's a real thing. Yeah. 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 The US, for example, students have uh, free access to yeah. So yeah. You can get free offer. Yeah. And the other one, I wish that you can tell them in a few words of this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Also, we will say this touch. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, if you please, I can repeat, repeat the, the question. question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, the, so there's two questions really. So the first question is the cost. How much does it cost? Well, it's free. <laughs> okay. So the so it's free to some to some degree. So first of all, all of the software is open source, right? I use Python and I use open source um, code. So so everybody has access to it for free. Most actually, I think no, that's not true. Most of what I show you has been run on a laptop, okay? So all the classification has been run on a laptop. Some of the applications, so the generation, the, the generative AI, for instance, that was run in the cloud, and also the SimClear, so the semi-supervised um, approach was also run in the cloud. So that means basically we used uh, an, um, a high-performance computer, okay, with, with GPUs. It's free because we're at a university, so we have access to these resources, without paying. If you have to pay, it's actually not that expensive. You can you can run it in the cloud on GCP, it's cheaper. So that's the Google uh, Cloud Platform. Um, AWS is the Amazon platform, uh, it's more expensive. But you can, for a, a modest amount of money, you can run this and you can also apply for grants as student or as educator to use for free the resources. Um, and it's not that hard. I think you can get compute time relatively easy. So I, th I don't think the cost for education is a big issue, uh, but you know what, I wish to thank you because it's very good that they do that in advance. So you can yeah. do some yeah. kind of a distribution of the yeah. Advance of the no, absolutely. I would say the cost is your time. Okay, so it's very important. It's something I get frustrated when I review paper, but it's very important to spend the time to learn the ropes well because it's fairly easy to do deep learning it's it's very easy, it's very hard to do it well so you really need to learn uh you know the you need to learn the the the, the methods and there's a lot of free pretty available courses out there i have some on youtube but there's also a lot of other people who do the same so spend the time to to learn it now your other question is what is the difference between model-based uh, models or, or computing computing which is mostly what you do and these data. So these, this is known as data modeling or database model. Okay, so the difference is, imagine that you have a system you want to model. It doesn't really matter what the system is. Um, let's say climate change, because I know you work on, on, on climate, right? One thing you can do is you can try to emulate the physics of it, okay? So you can say, right, so I know I have a, I have a grid here that represents my, my world. I know what the different processor, processes are that play a role. Could be, you know, you're looking at gas, diffusion, these kind of things. And then you have equation, equation of state for your system. And then you can actually step by step, so in a stepwise manner, you can model your system at step zero. And then you advance in time, right, or in space. You model the system at step two by applying your equations, your, your, your physics equations. So that's one approach. It's an approach that's been around for, for a very long time. And it's, I like to call it uh, process-based modeling, okay? 
Um, this type of stuff is very different. This is actually statistics, statistics uh, modeling, or it's based on data. You don't have any physics or any notion of, of process that's embedded. It can be, I'll mention this, but uh, in what I do, none, none of the geological processes are implied or embedded. Rather, we just look at the data, lots of data, and we learn from the distribution of the data to extract a, a, an a, um, empirical classifier or an empirical um, regressor. Okay, so that's a very different approach. Now, in the last 10 years, and certainly it's accelerated in the last five years, there is a tendency to merge the two fields. Because one of the problem with the type of work that you do, right? So I do that as well in some in some instances, is that it's slow. So it's 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 good because it's not a black box. You know exactly what's going on because you know you know what your equation of states are, so you know your physics, you know your process, you can look at them, but it takes a lot often a long time to compute very slowly. So one of the ideas is to use machine learning to get a quick estimate of the physics. So essentially, instead of doing the full calculation, you train a neural network to do the calculation for you. So literally what you do is you give numbers as your inputs, and then you give uh, the calculation results. So the output of a, a fully um, physics-based or process-based model as your output. And you train your neural network to emulate what this algorithm is doing. And you, the gain in time that you get, I've seen examples for, um, for like ocean models or atmospheric model, the, the gain in time is about 1,000. So four orders of magnitude faster with the physics-based machine learning uh, process. But it needs to be done well because you could also train a model that then does not represent reality after a few steps uh, in, in, the, in the emulation process. So that's a big area of research. Uh, Rosella works a lot on this. Uh, or Chris works a lot on this, and not really myself. So, but it's um, definitely interesting. So, is that what you wanted me to cover? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because we just published the day on anybody, I think it's so partially very good. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. And I think it, it does work. I mean, it's an approximation of the PDE, right? Yeah, exactly. But still, it, uh, it's, it's very fast. Okay. I, I have a question from the web by Francesca. Loza, she's a micropaleontologist. So, okay. so be sure that you are answering in the proper way. Yeah? Ouch. <laughs> so I said, Rick, thank you. And nice talk. Do you envisage this technique would be favorable for microfossil identification? So yeah. be careful. Yeah. Wait. Is there 3D nature a problem for forums, for instance? What can be done to deal with this fossil? Nothing, I can tell you. <laughs> and uh, uh, not yet described. What can be done with fossils that are not yet described so that you cannot train, uh, you have no reference images yeah. Yeah. that could be overlooked? Yeah, 100%. So uh, first of all, people are doing uh, microfossils with deep learning. Um, it, it's like it's been done before or it's being currently done. And, and definitely it is a, an obvious target. It's uh, one of the components. It is harder. You, I think for me, the hardest bit is getting the training data set. It's very difficult because, you know, if you ask a, an expert, you know, give me some good material so that I have a good reference material to train my neural network, you're lucky if you get 20 images back. And you're like, <laughs> what can I do with this, right? I need 20,000, please, or 200,000. So that, I think that's the main, uh, the main issue. But Francesca has a very good point. You, with what I've shown, with those classical um, approaches, you can only classify what you have already in your classes. You cannot come up with a new class. If you give a new species to the algorithm, it's going to tell you it's it's a species that it already knows. And maybe if you're lucky, it'll say, well, 60% so confident. Yeah. confidence. Yeah, that's it. But you probably are going to be not lucky. And it's probably going to be so close to a, to a species that is in the training set that it will say is that species because mm -hmm. it's closer to that than everything else, right? Mm -hmm. There are other machine learning approaches that are unsupervised. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a very, very active area of research where you can start to cluster things. So clustering is still done in a way that, that's very, it's more like the statistics. It's not deep learning. It's more statistical uh, machine learning. It's not really applied with a lot of success to computer vision. But I think this is where we should really be going uh, 
a superposition of supervised and unsupervised, where you first cluster, once you have a cluster, you say, ah, yeah, oh yeah, of course, that's Blower Gerina, right? And and then you can put the label on, on your image. So it's, a, so it's a difficult problem. I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. And I think, you know, I, I was telling you, right, that I think this is going to be a 10 year process, but I think in 10 years, we'll have tools that assist you. I don't think it will come this way. I think it will assist you, right? And and free you from a lot of the things. But I, I, I still think that there, you're gonna have to have, you know, in fact, that's one of my worries, by the way, with deep learning, is that we lose expertise. We lose human expertise, which is already something that happens. We were discussing losing microbiology expertise, right? Because uh, of funding, this is maybe gonna, gonna accelerate this. And that's, that would be a shame. Mm. Okay, if there is no other question from the audience, we will thank again Cedric for this beautiful seminar. Oh, thank you all for attending this seminar. Thanks a lot. So this was the last seminar of this series for this year, even if we are in 2024, but this was still from the 2023 series. So I will uh, soon open a call uh, for the next series uh, for my speakers for the next series of distinguished lecturer in the science. So if you have any scientists that you would if you would like to invite, please uh, send me an email. You will receive a call and then you send me an email. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, then thank you all in on the web. And bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay.